Hello and for person, this is Anton, and today we're going to try to once again talk about the definition of planets. Planets like Mars, and planets like Earth, but also planets like Io right here. But wait, Anton, Io is not a planet, it's a moon. It's a moon of Jupiter. Or is it? So today we're actually going to be discussing this relatively intriguing study, the study that, as always, you can find in the description below, that argues a point that a lot of planetary scientists agree with. Our current definition of what a planet is, is actually somewhat wrong. As a matter of fact, it's somewhat unscientific. In a sense that it borrows a lot of ideas from astrology and not from actual astronomy. And back in 2006, when the International Astronomical Union officiated this definition, that's when, unfortunately, objects like Pluto lost their definition of being a planet, which first of all obviously upset a lot of people, but second of all, as the scientists in this paper claim, was actually done extremely rushed for basically unscientific reasons, and more importantly, used some really unusual features to define what a planet actually is. Now, as you might already know, there are three main features that an object has to possess, according to this definition, to be a planet. First of all, it obviously has to orbit some sort of a star. In our case, it would be the Sun. Second of all, it has to have enough mass to turn spherical. We usually refer to this as hydrostatic equilibrium. And so far, by this definition, Pluto is still a planet. But then there's also another definition that sort of changed everything. It has to have an ability to clear the neighborhood of other potential objects orbiting in the same uh, vicinity. Now, this is where it gets really tricky. The reason why International Astronomical Union and some other scientists do not think Pluto is considered to be a planet is because once in a while it does actually kind of cross the orbit of Neptune, at least if you were to look at this in three dimensions. Here's actually what the orbit looks like roughly, and as you can see it does once in a while pass relatively close to the Sun, even closer than Neptune. And at the same time several other objects were discovered around the same time in 2006, Objects like Eris, for example, that you see right here, that are even slightly more massive than Pluto and are even farther away than Pluto. When the scientists originally discovered this, this was supposed to be the 10th planet. But over time they found more similar objects, such as Sedna, Oumuamua and so on. And because of this, they realized that these objects might just not be planets. Today we refer to them as dwarf planets. And so the argument here was that, well, now the kids in school will have to memorize too many planets for the solar system. And although it does maybe make sense to some extent, it really doesn't make sense for one major reason. It's not a good definition. It's a definition that sort of defines an object simply by its orbit and is only based on one single feature. We normally refer to this as planetary dynamics, basically the orbits of planets. It does actually consider what the object is by itself on the inside. And the scientists in this paper make a really good comparison here. It's as if we define a mammal based on where the animal lived and how it moved, not based on the actual genetics or essentially the biology of the animal. For example, would an animal be a mammal if it moved in large groups and lived on land? Well, obviously it sort of defines horses that you see right here, but then again we have mammals living in the water and we have some mammals living completely by themselves. So the motion or the movement of the object should not really be the defining feature of a certain object. In other words, we should not be defining planets simply by their orbit. And that's why we shouldn't really be defining planets this way. And ironically, most planetary scientists, most um, scientists working with planets, usually accept a completely different definition, independent of what IAU decided in 2006. This definition is generally referred to as the geological definition of planets. And unlike the dynamical definition of planets, it focuses entirely on the activity on and inside this particular object. And by this definition, a planet is a geologically active substellar body. It can be a satellite. And in addition to eight planets that we already know of, these include a lot of dwarf planets, including Eris and Pluto, but also certain planetary moons as well, including our own moon and including many moons around Jupiter. And generally, this particular definition sees the planets this way. We have five terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Moon, and Mars. We have giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. But then we also have quite a lot of different satellite and dwarf planets, with nearly 150 of them in existence. And so, in some sense, I guess this would be somewhat difficult to remember 
especially if you're just learning about astronomy. But on the other hand, as a young child, you would actually be fascinated with this idea. The idea that there are 150 different objects out there, with many of them with strange names, many of them containing extremely different properties from what we would find on planet Earth. And as a matter of fact, having taught many children before, when I actually told them this, well, most of them were absolutely excited to learn about it. They were not afraid to learn their names. But that's of course beside the point. Well, okay, let's step back a little bit. Let's actually talk a little bit more about how we came to the current definition that the IAU accepted back in 2006, which also directly connects to the point being made in this paper. So first of all, we know that the idea of planets and the definition of planets has actually existed for thousands of years. One of the first mentions of planet as an astronomical object and the attempt to define them can actually be found in a lot of different tablets left from the Babylonian Empire that existed approximately 3,000 years ago, with this tablet right here, known as the Venus Tablet of Amisa Duqua, representing the first official observations of the motions of planet Venus, with some other tablets also talking about other planets as well. Although in this case we really are talking about the so-called five classical planets that are visible with the naked eye. We're talking about Mercury, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. Neither Uranus nor Neptune were visible or known to these cultures. But what exactly were these tablets for and what was mentioned inside of them? Well, the main purpose of these tablets was astrological. They were sort of describing the motions of different objects in the night skies and then trying to associate all of this with a list of omens, a list of relationship between various celestial phenomena and potentially even mythology itself and religious practices. In other words, a lot of this was used for prediction purposes or to see if something could occur if there was a certain alignment in the night skies. Which is also the basis for Western astrology today as well. So a lot of the Western astrology based their ideas on a lot of these ancient Babylonian practices. And then with the invention of modern telescope, two more planets were discovered and in 1931, Pluto. Although according to the initial observations, this object was really, really big. It was even believed to be bigger than the planet Earth. But because of the discovery of Eris and a lot of other trans-Neptunian objects, that's when the scientists, some scientists, proposed a new clause to the definition of planets that involved that orbital parameter where the planet has to clear its neighborhood. Which of course creates its own issue as well. What exactly is a neighborhood? For example, when it comes to the closest approach of Pluto to Neptune, the approach here is about 16 AU, which is 16 times the distance of Sun to planet Earth. Now that's pretty far away. And although in this simulation you see that it does actually cross the orbit of Neptune, that's obviously only if you look from the top. Here's roughly what it sort of looks like from the top view. But if we were to look at this in three dimensions, you'll notice that it actually doesn't come close to Neptune at all. And so a lot of these little things made this decision extremely controversial and made a lot of planetologists quite upset. The majority of planetologists do not seem to accept that definition, including a lot of major NASA scientists. And that actually includes the primary investigator behind the New Horizons probe, the probe that uh, reached Pluto, the iconic Alan Stern. Furthermore, this paper goes into a little bit more history, definitively showing that the current definition of planets seems to be entirely based on this Western astrology and more specifically seems to be based on what they refer to as the almanacs. So sort of like the astrology you find in modern newspapers. Here the predictions were simply based on the position of planets in the night skies and were then trying to imply that something is going to happen. These publications were extremely popular in the 19th century and early 20th century and because of this the scientists believe that a lot of the modern planetary definitions came from these ideas, these astrological ideas, that simply saw the planets as something moving in the night skies with a certain orbit around the sun, not actual objects with actual properties. But more importantly, prior to the 19th century, there was actually a geophysical definition of a planet established by Galileo Galilei himself. A planet had to be a geologically active object, and this is indeed what a lot of planetary scientists are trying to push for as well. They're trying to move away from this astrological definition involving orbits to a definition that involves a property of an object and more specifically geological activity on the object. So in other words, a planet is an object with complex geological activity on the surface, somewhat independent of the actual orbit around the star system. 
and more specifically because these orbits can be extremely different. The scientists here give another example. If suddenly a star comes into the solar system and disrupts our solar system, a lot of the objects that were previously planets might not be planets anymore because they're going to be orbiting in a very different way and potentially not have these stable orientations anymore. So does that mean that if something disrupts planet Earth, it's not going to be a planet anymore? Well, if it finds itself in, for example, an orbit crossing Jupiter, by this definition, the answer is no. But according to Galileo Galilei and a lot of modern planetary scientists, it's still a planet because it's geologically active. And because Pluto is also geologically active, with one of the recent papers even discovering that the iconic feature on Pluto known as Sputnik Planitia is actually formed geologically through a process of sublimation of nitrogen, furthermore establishes that according to the geophysical definition, Pluto is indeed a planet after all. And that's actually despite the point that Pluto is so far away from the Sun that the Sun should not be causing any kind of sublimation. So it's definitely driven by some kind of a geological activity on the inside. In other words, it's really important for an object to have internal properties and a lot of internal activity in order to be classified as one of these planets. And so the main proposition here is not to have a simply defined eight planets, which by the way are already quite different from one another, but to instead have different categories of planets with dramatically different properties on the inside. With I guess one major change being the moon is now a planet. It's a terrestrial planet. And that of course makes sense because the moon, the satellite of planet Earth, is way bigger and more influential on planet Earth than any other moon in orbit of any other major planet including Jupiter and Saturn. Which also means that Earth and Moon is technically a binary planetary system. And when it comes to simplifying the idea of learning planets and learning their names in, for example, young children, teaching school children to understand the diversity of the universe and, of course, the diversity of planets in our solar system is way, way more important than just teaching them eight names of eight different planets and kind of calling it quits after that. And so in that sense, the scientists in this paper make a really strong argument. And as the scientists mentioned in the paper, in general, planets in any orbital state are unique as engines of complexity in the cosmos. And that line by itself is very difficult to argue with. You cannot simply say something is a planet just because it's moving around the night skies in a certain way. You really have to look at the internal structure of this object. You have to see what's happening on the inside and the outside and then determine its physical properties in order to establish what sort of an object it is. With this right here still being the best geophysical definition of a planet. But if you'd like to read about some other arguments that the scientists make in this paper, it's as always in the description below. There are some really interesting propositions they make, including of course, explaining how exactly we came to the current definition of the planet, which they argue comes from Western astrology, not actual astronomy or actual science. And that by itself is a bit of a problem. But anyway, on that note, thank you for watching. All of the relevant links are in the description below. Subscribe if you still haven't. Share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. And maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, stay wonderful. I'll see you tomorrow. And as always, bye-bye. All right.
let's go and memorize some more planets in the solar system. I have about 140 to go, 